Thank you and welcome everyone. I am Juliet Shore and I'm very pleased this evening to be able to introduce Nomi Prince. Nomi is a former banker, an author, a journalist, a senior fellow at Demos, um, and a very accomplished public speaker. She is a leading voice in our country on the role of finance in economics and politics. Nomi did her undergraduate degree in mathematics at SUNY Purchase, and she did graduate work in statistics at uh, New York University, earning a master's in statistics. While she was still in college, she began working in finance at, at what was then called Chase Manhattan Bank. And afterwards, she took a full-time job at the bank as an analyst. She subsequently had a meteoric rise at a number of leading financial institutions, uh, Lehman Brothers, where she created the financial analysts uh, department, at Bear Stearns, where she spent seven years running their analytics department, and eventually she went on to Goldman Sachs, where she was a managing director. Uh, Nomi would later write uh, that in the US, we have government by Goldman and for Goldman. Um, I do want to note here, uh, number one, how stellar her accomplishments at the upper reaches of Wall Street were, especially given the male uh, uh, domination of that culture. Um, she was really an outstanding technical analyst at a time when, and it unfortunately is still the case, that's an especially male-dominated part of the field. Uh, Prince has an amazing insider's uh, seat and knowledge to uh, what's been going on uh, in our financial system, and in particular, the global financial collapse of 2008, which she details in her most recent book, uh, Collusion, how central bankers rigged the world. Um, after 9-11, Prinz left Goldman, uh, in part after being told that she should not consider her clients to actually be her customers, but uh, she should be working uh, to please senior management, and that didn't sit too well with her. Since then, she's had a remarkable career as a writer and a journalist with a series of always heavily researched, engrossing books. Um, in 2004, she wrote Other People's Money, uh, The Corporate Mugging of America, which warned us about the financial debacle to come. And of course, she was one of the first uh, and only insiders uh, to, to, to warn about what was going, uh, what would later occur with the uh, collapse of 2008. Um, she wrote It Takes a Pillage in 2009, which is Anatomy of the Crash. Wonderful titles. Um, and then her magisterial All the President's Bankers uh, in 2014, a century, uh, which is a book looking at a century of political influence by six behemoth financial institutions. She has a stellar uh, journalistic record, having written for the New York Times, Fortune, The Guardian, The Nation, and she's a regular contributor to the always indispensable Tom Dispatch. If you want to understand what's going on in finance, Nomi Prinz is a must read. And we're very fortunate tonight to have her. Uh, Collusion, um, which I was lucky enough to get an advanced copy of, uh, is, is a fantastic, um, um, uh, engrossing, and uh, extremely insightful book about the crash and what has happened since then. And I, I'm, I'm sure she's going to tell us quite a bit about that. Uh, after the event, Nomi and I will be signing books in the lobby. Um, Collective Works uh, is here. Um, Collusion is not yet out, but um, I recommend it very highly. And if you just let the bookstore folks know that you'd like a copy, they will uh, pre-order one for you, and then you can make sure to get it. I have a feeling it may sell out very quickly from the first round. So. Um, if you will all join me now uh, in welcoming Nomi Prince. Thank you for that um, lovely trip down my life. <laughs> um, and thank you all so much for, for being here tonight. Um, you know, special thanks. It's an honor to be speaking here on behalf of the Lennon Foundation. Um, 
with all of the amazing work that they do in general and, and also in putting this, this night together. This is my first time in Santa Fe. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, um, I, I've been here almost 24 hours now and I, I can say it's been an awesome, awesome uh, stretch of a day. Um, and, and, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very honored to, to, to be here before you tonight. Um, what's interesting about Santa Fe and tonight and all of the themes that Juliet mentioned in terms of the work that, that I've done um, is that it's kind of a skiing place. You know, this is, this is a place where, where people come to and sort of go off to do that. Um, and another elite skiing place in, in the world is, is Davos, Switzerland. Um, and right now, <laughs> while we are here, um, the president is, is flying or about to fly um, to, to Davos to, to say some things. And, um, <laughs> and um, the, last, the last several days there, and, and um, it sounds like you, you, are, you are very aware of what, what Davos is, but um, it, it is an elite sort of vehicle for um, the most elite business leaders, finance ministers, world leaders, central bankers, and so forth to sort of gather um, and drink champagne and talk about sort of the, the, the world's issues. Um, and so one of the themes this year is, is, is populism, um, which is interesting at, at a place where, um, <laughs> um, and I, I was talking to Juliet about this but before the event in the green room, I don't think any of these people have ever even been camping. <laughs> so, 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 so the idea of discussing populism from where they're staying um, these evenings is, is just bizarre. The populistic, though, element of some of the people, not so much the, the CEOs, but, but some of the other um, leaders there, is that um, their trip there is, is paid for by, by us, so, um, and, and, and groups like us throughout the world, so, so there is that, that element. Um, so, <laughs> it's true. Um, so, so I want to I want to step sort of back into um, how I am viewing what's going on um, in, in Davos, but how how it's really a, a manifestation of where we have been um, in the last ten years since the financial crisis. As Juliet mentioned, I've, I've certainly um, I was on Wall Street when the financial crisis was being concocted. Um, I was at Bear Stearns when uh, the euro was created in 1999, and at the time we were having conversations about how we could trade around it and which kind of customers we could get in and out of, what types of transactions that could benefit um, from, from the new currency. And, um, and one of the things I did back then when I started to um, have, th have some negative thoughts about the industry um, of which I had been a part since, since I was 19, since I started at Chase, um, was that it was starting to collapse the world. So, so even in the late 1990s, we had an Asian crisis. We had a Russian and Eastern European crisis. Um, there was problems manifesting throughout the world that were a result of the things that banks were doing um, with respect to, to pushing debt and, and different types of transactions and securities onto um, less informed and less capable of repaying that debt countries. It wasn't the first time there were collapses from um, a crisis standpoint in the late 90s, but, but it was the first time I was involved in sort of the other side of that. Um, and one of the things that I actually mentioned to some students today, I don't know if they're here, um, from, a, from, a, from a master's class that um, participates in a sort of high school to college um, education um, element at um, Santa Fe uh, Community College, is, is that um, the uniqueness of being there in banking at Bear Stearns and going to something which was a huge demonstration um, in a city called Birmingham um, in the United Kingdom. And in Birmingham, many people from around Europe were coming and joining together um, to participate in a demonstration that was called Jubilee 2000. So this, this was way back, and the idea of Jubilee 2000 was that people should realize that the debt incurred upon countries that could not afford to repay it by banks and governments that could um, and that had the wherewithal to achieve funds to repay um, debt if they took it on, but pushed it on other countries, was, was something that was unsustainable. Um, and so there I was working as, a, at the time, a senior managing director at Bear Stearns, and, and sort of having all these um, thoughts about how unright this was um, in terms of some of the things that we were doing. And we were pretty small, Bear Stearns in London, in the scheme of um, what J.P. Morgan was doing, what Goldman Sachs was doing at the time, and so forth. But it, it just didn't make a lot of sense. So you know, I took off on a Friday to go on a weekend to uh, drive up to, to Birmingham. Um, 
And I was in a church before the demonstration, and there was a woman there named Ann Pettifor. Um, and I don't know if you're familiar with Ann Pettifor. She's, she's a brilliant economist, very progressive. Now she, um, she's one of the people, among many of the other things that she's done in her lifetime, um, that advises um, Parliament on, on, on issues that relate to actual real populism and, and real economics and foundational economics. Um, but by the time I was a young banker and she was just someone who was speaking at a church and she'd come back from Africa um, where there was a lot of problems, she had traversed through Africa and she was just, just talking about the sort of devastation and the poverty on the ground and a lot of it at the hands of um, sort of financial complex transactions that various governments had taken their own cuts of and then sort of imposed upon the people in their various countries and she started to talk about these stories and she started to just cry you know and I'm, I'm sitting there in this church and you know, I got to go back to my day job at the bank on Monday and 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 it just it just kind of struck a, a real chord um, and years later um, actually this year I realized that um, she was going to be speaking in London on some of these issues with a with a now colleague of mine Jim Rickards who I, who I write with who writes um, wrote a book called currency wars and different things about the monetary system um, he's more on the right side she's more on the left but it doesn't matter because the monetary system doesn't care um, about political affiliation. You know, the elites don't really care who you vote for. Um, it really doesn't matter. What, what matters is the policies that get instilled in the back of that. Um, but I wrote to her and I said, you know, almost 20 years later, um, I was in this church, you know, at Jubilee 2000 in Birmingham, and I saw you, and like, oh my God, you're now sort of talking with a colleague of mine, and this is kind of the trajectory um, of where life has, has taken me, has taken the world, because on a lot of many elements, the world is so much less stable than it was in 1999. The debt that's been incurred upon these countries is, is so much worse um, than it was at the time, and nothing has really changed. In fact, um, in many instances, it has become significantly worse. Um, but yet, there you are, and there I am, and I just want to tell you that what you said um, to those people in that church before a million and a half of us or so were, were holding hands around around Birmingham and, and talking about um, canceling this debt, which didn't happen, um, that that really struck a chord, and, and I, I just want to thank you. And she was, she was very sweet, and we're now Twitter pals and everything else, and I hope to um, see her when I go to London to actually talk at Parliament um, on the 14th when my book comes out. So, so, so there's a lot of things that, that have changed um, for me, but a lot of things that have stayed the same in terms of how um, the sort of elite deal with the rest of the world. Um, so the current book that I have, and I'm not really here to talk about the book, but I'm saying it because it is a book I wrote, but in the process of writing it, I went around the world again. And I went around the world from Mexico to Brazil to Japan to China to throughout Europe and so forth, um, but different than I did when I was a banker, when, when I also went around the world. When I went around the world then, it was a very different context. When I first worked at Lehman Brothers, so this is before 99, I first worked at Lehman Brothers in the early 90s. Lehman Brothers no longer exists. Of course, Bear Stearns, where I worked for in London in 1999, also no longer exists. So I've got, I've got two out of four banks that I worked for that, that no longer exist. So, so there's that. But um, I, um, I was a junior sort of analyst on the futures and options desk at Lehman Brothers in the early 90s. And the things that we did back then were sort of the, the nascent financial engineering elements of what became derivatives, of what became toxic assets, of what ultimately imploded um, the financial system in 2008. But back then, they were sort of simpler. Um, and one of the things that was going on was I was writing the analytics and programming um, the math behind some of these products. And then there were salespeople on the trading desk that would go out to different customers and say, hey, if you buy these products, you'll do really well, we'll do really well, everybody will be happy, and you'll make a lot of money. Um, and my, my job was to basically create again, the math for this. Um, and I started to get into the fight of this fight with the salesperson, because I thought he was kind of brutish. And, um, and, I, um, and he also used to lot, take a lot of credit for stuff I was doing, and that just didn't sit well with me, because it's like, look, you, know, you do your thing, you're good at selling, I do my thing, I'm good at math. Um, and we should, at the very least, sort of honor that about each other. Um, and we started having these like, major fights, like literal fights on the trading floor. And at Lehman Brothers, the way the trading floor physically looked, 
um, was that it was like a, a big space of, of lots of different sort of desks with, at the time, Bloomberg terminals. Um, so Michael Bloomberg's like invention before he became mayor of New York and so forth. It was, it was, they were on everything. Um, and then there were screens um, on the top. So every time the Federal Reserve said something around Greenspan said something, it, it was up there and we'd stand around and watch it. And then all around the side of this room were glass um, offices. And in the glass offices were all of the managers of the firm. They stayed close to the trading areas of the firm, with the areas that made the most money. Um, and so one of the people that ran the firm at the time, Dick Fold, who ran it the whole time through the financial crisis, um, was kind of there with, with, with the sort of people under him, and they're sort of watching me fight with the salesperson. I mean, we're not fighting, we're not you know, punching each other, but I mean, it was, it, there were words. Um, and so management decided, because they were interested in this product that, that we had developed, that um, we should go on the road together. <laughs> so that, and that, you know, either A, I was going to come back, he was going to, you know, something was going to happen, um, but we should, we should do that and we should. So, so they set up a series of um, meetings with central banks um, in Asia. So it wasn't like even going around the world to like London, it was going around the world to Malaysia and to Singapore and to the Philippines um, and, and just to see what would sort of happen with the product and with us. So we did that. Um, and one of the places, we stopped at Malaysia first, we went on to the Philippines, we almost didn't get out of the Philippines, there was a sort of incident of trying to get to the airport to get to China, and you know, the sort of taxi driver being late and sort of jumping the side of the other side of the street and going in oncoming traffic to get us there. And this brings you closer um, to people you don't like when you're, when, you're, when you're in the back seat of a car just like holding on for dear life. Um, and then we went, we went on to China. And, so I actually met with the People's Bank of China back before there were mostly, you know, many international hotels in China, back when it was not part of um, sort of the, the superpower community that it is today in Davos and that's become over the years. It was still sort of a nascent thing. Um, so there I am sitting with a salesperson and a bunch of um, bankers from, from the Central Bank of China talking about this product from Lehman. And I'm also a vegetarian as a whole separate other thing. And one of the things that they served us at one of the dinners was, was drunken prawns. And I don't know if you know, it's, it's, it's tragic. They, 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 they stick live prawns in a, in a boiling pot and then they turn it up and then the, the prawns start moving around and, and then they eat them. And I, yeah, no, no disrespect to anyone who likes that sort of thing, but it was kind of like, so I'm sitting there um, dealing with the prawns and the, and the bank and the sky <laughs> and, um, and trying to sell a, a product called um, Term Ted Spreads, which, which all that meant was we were trying as a bank to get our treasury bonds that we get from um, effectively through the Fed from the United States government, trying to sell those bonds to the People's Bank of China um, and a lot of banks sell to them. They don't get them directly from the government. They get them through different investment banks who are called primary dealers um, from, the, from the government. Um, and, and these primary dealers compete with each other to sell those treasury securities to um, central banks or, or to other types of customers. So the product we had developed at Lehman was, was kind of providing a way to have them buy the treasury bonds from us, from Lehman Brothers, um, as well as a couple of other derivatives in the mix from which we could also make money. So, so the idea was to explain this to them mathematically, have them buy more treasury bonds from us and sort of call it a day. Anyway, so this trip lasted a few weeks. One of the things we did in China was go see the Great Wall of China, because you know, as you do. Um, when you're there. And, um, and at the time, again, it, it was very different from what it was when I went back last summer to research this book because um, there were no buses, there were no like massive amounts of tourists from everywhere else. There was like this old woman selling these, these silk um, scarves that she had made and it was very cold and you know, there was like three of us there from Lehman Brothers one morning um, and we were the tour. Um, and and that, 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 that's changed significantly as things have opened up. Markets have opened up um, and everything has changed. Um, when I went back into China to research um, that chapter for collusion, um, it, it was a very different place. Um, and I sat in meetings with people from the IMF in China and the Asian Development Bank and, and all sorts of other um, individuals who were coming together to figure out how to open the markets even more in order to be more part of the international community and to be more part of um, leading the world in terms of its currency and, and other things. And this was a direct manifestation of markets becoming more global, but also policies that had been set in place in the wake of our financial crisis of 2008. So when 2008 happened, um, 
it was because our banks, banks like now J.P. Morgan Chase, Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns, which don't exist anymore, Goldman Sachs, uh, Bank of America, and so forth, were Citigroup were creating toxic assets or manufacturing new securities out of subprime loans. That's a kind of old story at this point. But I just want to explain a little bit of it because it relates to where we are today um, and how the same stuff is going on just on a broader scale and just kind of in more secret at the same time. Um, toxic assets or, or securitized stuff, whether it is securitized subprime mortgages or corporate loans or debt or toll road payments or wine receipts, doesn't matter. But the idea is that you are sticking a bunch of stuff into a larger security and it's supposed to pay interest. And based on how much interest it pays into that security, the security is then cut up into other pieces and it itself pays interest to the investors or the buyers of those pieces. And there is something called a waterfall or, or a hierarchy about those pieces called, called tranches. And there's no reason for them to be called tranches except it sounded French and cool and that's what the street decided to call them. They're pieces. They're slices of, of a larger security. And the idea is that you have kind of an order. And if you buy what's considered to be the most um, purest piece, the piece that's going to get its interest payments first and therefore pay the investors their interest payments first for buying it, um, that's a higher rated piece. That's a triple A piece. You start to go down the slices or the tranches of that security, you get to the bottom um, at something called an equity tranche. And the reason it's called an equity tranche or an equity piece um, is because it will not pay out anything until all of the other payments have gone out to all the other different investors that have bought all of the different slices um, of this larger security. The problem is if no interest payments are going into the security or if there is fraud about the amount of interest payments going into the security, nothing comes out. So nobody gets paid. And ultimately, 60 to 70 percent of the worst assets that were created during the financial crisis by the major banks who then sold them on to different countries and different municipalities and pension funds and so forth weren't paying anything. That's why the financial crisis happened because what happens when banks aren't able to receive from each other the payments that they bought and sold on some of these securities in the process of selling them elsewhere, um, they start to close their doors. They either close their doors sort of forever and, and companies go bankrupt, like Bear Stearns, which almost did, but instead got sold to J.P. Morgan Chase, um, and Lehman Brothers, which just kind of dissipated. Um, but otherwise, these institutions stop trusting each other, and the system collapsed. And what happened in the wake of that collapse was both a political and a monetary solution to the collapse and to fix what was called the systemic or the emergency systemic problem of the financial system, which was to infuse these banks with money. They weren't getting money. Um, so not only did we, as a government, bail them out, which was a small portion of the sort of subsidies they received, the largest banks, um, but also our main central bank, the Federal Reserve, um, got involved in manufacturing money in order to repay them. Um, so rather than, say, fixing some of these assets, some of these uh, actual mortgages that made up these securities, um, and actually, which would have been a far cheaper solution and we wouldn't be anywhere near the situation of instability that we are actually in today, um, they decided to instead infuse these same banks with more money, right? So, so, so it's like, I was just in Vegas last week and, um, and I went to play blackjack as you do and I, I sometimes forget the stuff I say about how you should perceive certain situations. So I know um, when I talk to investors or I, or I sort of write pieces that the right thing to do, that the sane, stable, logical, preserving thing to do is to have a sense for if you do make money to get out and not continue to bet, and if you're losing money, not to continue to put more in. I mean, these are just things that we should all do in life. Um, but so I'm, so I'm at the blackjack table with, with, with a friend, and it's, it's always bad to sort of team up. It's really better to do these things on your own. Um, 
who, who, is, who has no philosophy. It was just like sort of putting money down and losing it. And I was very sanguine about the whole thing because I understand blackjack. Um, in fact, I was telling Julia before that one of the reasons I actually was accepted by some of the Bear Stearns men at the time um, in the 90s when I was like the only woman working there, certainly the only person with a title and, and running a department ultimately, um, was that I beat all of them in a game called Liar's Poker. <laughs> so, so, so one of the first things I had to do in London was be in like a seedy pub. Um, with all these guys from like all of these sort of places, Bear Stearns was kind of considered the, the Wild West of finance, um, particularly in London, um, and, and basically be there, um, you know, not late, but, but intensely, because the pubs close at 12, um, winning, winning, winning their money, and, and that was kind of how, how I was accepted. Um, so I do understand that there, there's a certain element towards leaving when you need to leave. I didn't do that last week at first. Um, I just forgot, I, whatever, and, and I... Um, I put down 100 bucks on blackjack, and I was up 30, and you should walk away. And I didn't, and, and, and I, you know, my friend went through like 100 like in nanoseconds. I kind of stayed around, I looked at cards, I did, but I wasn't, I wasn't sort of concentrating on that sort of exit strategy. Um, and, and, and I wound up losing it, and I wound up having a conversation um, on it in my mind, and saying, you know what I didn't do? is I didn't consider an exit strategy for inflating my position at the blackjack table. Like, I should have left. And I should have played, if I wanted to, with the house's money, you know, pocket the 100 bucks, come out, play with the 30 bucks, you win, you win, you lose, you lose, but you're not taking it from your pocket at that point. Um, and it becomes your sort of excess uh, capital at that point. But, 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 but you're not borrowing it from someone else. You're not taking it from your own pocket. You're kind of, you're kind of walking out with a strategy um, in place. Um, and so I went back and did that. And I said, OK, let me just for my own edification, for my own sanity, I'm going to go back to the blackjack table. I'm going to do this. And this does not mean that I know I'm going to win in blackjack. Or not. It's not the point. The point is that I had an exit strategy. If I lose this much, I leave. If I win this much, I leave. And, and I went back and I, you know, I, I took 50 bucks at this point because, again, you shouldn't take the other 100 at this point because I lost the 100. So I took 50 um, and I made 20 and then I left. So I'm like, okay, this, this is actually how it should go. It is not about absolutes. It is, it is about percentages. Now, what happened in the wake of the financial crisis with respect to private banks from the central banks is, is nothing like that. What, what, what has happened in the last 10 years, and starting in 2008, is that the Federal Reserve led all of the other major central banks to infuse their private banking system with a lot of money. How do they do this? By a strategy called quantitative easing, which is like calling something a tranche. I mean, it's just an overly complicated term, um, quantitative easing. It's, it's, it's you're, you're, you're giving them money and you're buying stuff from them in, the in return to make it look like you're having an equal exchange. You're not. You're basically buying either treasury bonds back from these private banks, who as I mentioned to you are, are basically in the center of the treasury department and where they sell those treasury bonds to anyway. So it's, it's, you're, you're creating a triangle where the Federal Reserve effectively buys treasury bonds starting, it's one of the elements of quantitative easing, the, the first round, QE1, bought treasury bonds from the banks that got them from the treasury department and gave them back to the Fed and the Fed gave them cash. So it's, it's a closed triangle where basically the U.S. issues debt and the banks get money. I mean, that, that's what it is. So, so they started doing this with, with treasury bonds, and, and, and the, the reason it's easing is, is because if you buy treasury bonds, the price of them goes up, if anyone buys them, right? If anybody buys anything and there's enough demand for it, the old sort of classic economics or just sort of socio, you know, psychology is that you know, the price will go up. In bond math, if the price goes up, the rate goes down. Um, and, and that was how the Fed not only kept rates down from engineering rates down, from saying the Fed funds rate, the rate that banks pay each other to borrow money, we are going to keep calibrating downward to zero, which they did. But in order to keep it there, we're also going to give them money, buy bonds, have the price of the bonds go up, have the rates go down, and that's gonna just be an additional sort of downward pressure on rates. And then they didn't just buy treasury bonds from these banks, they also bought their crappy mortgage bonds. So, so, so the 30 or 35 percent of mortgage bonds that didn't sort of combust are, are hanging out at some of these banks, um, or they're hanging out as composites of other pieces of mortgage bonds at some of these banks, and nobody's buying them because they're crap. <laughs> 
So the Fed decides to buy them. So what, what that does is it doesn't just give the banks who were holding them more cash in return for the Fed taking those bonds. It also means that because there was demand, even though it was the Fed who was demanding these bonds, they can reprice upward all the other crap they have on their books. It's true, right? I mean, if you have a garage sale and you put all your like crappy couches and like old TVs and you know chipped mugs and stuff in one place, and someone's like, "Oh, I got this really cool chip mug. It's awesome. I just paid a hundred bucks for it," then you're going to mark up your next chip mug. You're not going to be like, "Well, it's only actually worth fifty cents." You're just not going to. So, and that's exactly what, what what banks did. They're like, "Okay, the the Fed altogether collectively bought four and a half trillion dollars worth of bonds from the banks." Trillion. So the GDP of the United States now is just under 20 trillion. So, so that's like 25% you know, of, of GDP equivalent. But it's also an even higher percentage of, of the assets that the big six banks are and were holding. It's about 60 to 65% equivalent to the assets that the top six banks are holding. Um, so it, it's, it's a lot of cash to be infused into banks in order to get crappy bonds or even treasury bonds. Um, but that's the current status of the Fed's book. So they did this in three steps, QE1, QE2, and QE3 over, over the few years after the financial crisis. Now, there's different things they could have done instead with that money. They could have, for example, helped to fortify the mortgages of people who had been screwed by the banks. They could have decided to you know, build better highways. They could have decided to you know, have high-speed trains like they do in China and Japan that actually work and are awesome. They could have, um, yeah, I'm, I'm from California. I live, um, I live partly in LA and in a town called Ojai, which was affected by um, the Thomas fire in, in, in December. I, I, I evacuated the first night from the fire. You know, and, and it's not like the Fed's money could have um, it kept the fire from occurring, but, but the Fed's money could have, or in general, conceptually, prevented the damage that the mudslides incurred upon surrounding towns after the fire, because there would have been actual funding to create um, you know, sustainable methods of keeping um, slides down when the rains came, which, which was an inevitable uh, sort of seasonal thing. It's, it's something that's happened um, in New Mexico as well. I mean, there's things that money could have been used or set aside for um, rather than simply buying these crappy bonds or buying debt that otherwise would not have been needed from the Treasury Department. And, and it, it was not needed because it, it never got used, right? I mean, it is sitting in the Fed's books. This is, this is debt that hasn't gotten used plus mortgage debt, m mortgage bonds that were created. Um, other things could have been done with that money. They weren't. And it wasn't just the Fed that was doing this. What, what happened was the Fed decided to sustain our financial system in this manner. But it also was like, well, it's a global world. These financial markets are interlocked. These banks are interdependent. They trade with each other. Um, they're investors borrow from them significantly to then go and buy other assets, stocks, bonds, and so forth. Like, we can't just have one country um, try to monitor its rates and buy bonds from its banks to keep rates down and money into these banks. Um, we have to make this global. And so what the Fed did was it got the European Central Bank involved, and it got the Bank of Japan involved, and Switzerland, and, and it, it basically said, look, we, we, we need this to happen collectively. Now, these banks didn't necessarily face the same um, initial crises that the U.S. faced, because for the most part, it was our banks that screwed up the entire world. It really wasn't the other banks. The other banks were a part of it, um, but they didn't have the same impact because they hadn't been manufacturing the toxic assets in the amounts that our banks manufactured them and sold them on to the rest of the world. They were just sort of to some extent bystanders, not so much the biggest European banks like Deutsche Bank or, um, or, or UBS, the Swiss bank, but, but for the most part, um, we're, we're not as involved. And, um, and yet their central banks had to basically play along in the same, in the same game of, of buying bonds from their banks and corporate bonds from their larger companies who are customers of these banks. Um, and in the case of Japan, um, equity uh, share, share products from, from their institutions um, in order to maintain an upward movement of all of the market.
So collectively, the major central banks in the world didn't just manufacture the $4.5 trillion that the Fed manufactured to go into our banking system instead of going into anything real. They manufactured almost $22 trillion. So now you're talking about, and, and they are still holding the, the assets, the bonds that they bought with this money they manufactured on their books. Um, and this is just the G7 central banks. So it's, it's effectively taken a decade of this process to continue, and it's still continuing, um, to really manifest what's, what's an artificial market. So we look at the stock market, which is, you know, roaring, you know, up at you know, historic highs, going from 24, 25, 26,000, and so forth. And we have a president who's taking credit for that. And not that the last president didn't also take credit. I mean, this is, this, again, this finance is, is completely bipartisan. It really doesn't matter what who, whoever's in power says. There, there are legislation issues that do matter. Um, but from the standpoint of money in, money out, it, it really doesn't make a difference. The capital doesn't care. Um, and so what's happened in the last year is what had been happening over the last 10 years, which is that markets have been bolstered by this, this central bank money that's gone into the private banks, that's gone into the major speculators, and that has lifted all these asset classes up to make up for the fact that rates are generally, on average, 0% for these banks. So in order to keep that entire global 0%, if the Fed starts to raise its rates, which it did um, for the first time by, by 25 basis points at the end of 2015, um, and then several times in 2016, three times last year, they've raised them a bit from zero. But other banks have lowered theirs or grown their quantitative easing measures. So, so the net result globally, um, collaboratively or, or collusively, is that we maintain this system where central banks are effectively lifting these markets. And then you add in things like the, the GOP tax plan. And what does that do? It enables companies who have been spending the last number of years buying their own stock with cheap money because they get to borrow at cheaper rates because A, rates are down everywhere, and B, their, their sort of bank um, mentors are, are working with them to create this debt um, because then they make money. Um, they're effectively continuing now with an additional tax cut to, to buy more of their shares. Um, so this isn't like they are actually paying people more or they are creating more jobs or creating more infrastructure or anything like that. And, and they've said this. They've, they've admitted this. This is all sort of public knowledge. Um, they are simply buying their own shares with this additional, and they will be with additional money. They don't even have yet. These tax cuts just, uh, you know, went into play and, 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 and screwed people, for example, in California and potentially here who have wildfire problems. Um, but they help these, these, these corporations receive more money in their pockets in the future that they are using now um, to buy more of their shares. And all of it has been connected to, to these policies of basically infusing the system with cheap money um, and allowing it to artificially stimulate the markets. That's not an inherently stable system. Um, that's a system by which any mistake, um, which is why the guys and women who are in Davos right now don't want to make that mistake, any mistake, any, any raising of a rate by too much too quickly, any actual what they call tapering or reducing the size of that $21.7 trillion that's sort of lifting or acting as a concrete you know, foundation for the markets um, and for the banks in those markets would have, any, any sort of alteration too quickly um, could unravel all of what's happened in the last 10 years. And when they unravel, they unravel debt markets first. They unravel the companies that borrowed money, borrowed too much relative to what they were able to bring in. Um, the countries that borrow too much money, the countries that borrow too much money in dollars, um, as the dollar has d been declining in the wake of all of these sort of bizarre policies. Um, and ultimately, defaults are, or the inability to repay this debt starts to become the norm. It's not really there yet. Um, because they're sitting there trying to figure out how not to make that happen. I went and I addressed the Fed a few years ago, and um, the topic was, it was the Fed, the IMF, and the World Bank. And the topic at the time was um, how, to, how to sort of induce the banks to be responsible to the main economy. I, I know. The question was actually, why isn't Wall Street help, helping Main Street? That, that was sort of the question of our, of our closing. So, so I'm at 
um, the room in the Fed where, where the FOMC, the, the Federal Open Market Committee that sets rates and decides on some of these policies meets. Um, you know, and Janet Yellen spoke and a number of you know, central bankers are there from around the world and they're all skeptical of what's going on um, because they understand and generally the, the outside world understands some of the instability that this, this sort of policy has brought into the rest of the world. Um, and right before I spoke, there was a cardinal that spoke and he had just basically met with the Pope and he was going around the world talking about how it's important to remember the poor. So he, so he, he, he talks right before me and he, and he gives this, you know, he didn't talk about finance. I mean, he's, he's a cardinal. He, he talked about the idea of, of, you know, not incurring usury rates on people, of, of understanding sort of the plight of those less fortunate, and of just remembering the poor. I mean, that was what his talk was about, everybody sort of nodding. And then, um, and then he finished speaking, and I spoke after him. And I started, I had slides and stuff, but I started by saying, so, so you create a policy whereby you provide trillions of dollars of cash for like nothing, you know, for chipped mugs, right? You, you provide cash to a system and you require absolutely nothing in return for that cash. You, you, you don't require, you know, an extra amount of small business loans to be given. You don't require an extra amount. These are, all, all this money goes to the, the biggest national, international banks. You, you don't require um, more infrastructure funding on a local level or on a state level or on even a, a minor interstate level. You, you require absolutely nothing. And, and you're sitting here having this bizarre question session as to why Wall Street's not helping. You know, like, why would they? Which is what I said, like there, there's no reason why someone who is receiving money, you know, you're Jamie Dimon, you're running JP Morgan Chase, you have all of these opinions um, about how banks shouldn't even have more rules attached to them anyway because you've just made all this money, you've been gifted, my old company, Bear Stearns, years ago, you've been gifted um, Washington Mutual with help from the government. Um, you're sort of happy about your lot in life, you, you've, your stock has gone from you know, it's up 10 to 12 fold, depending on the bank, between March 2009 and when I was speaking in, in late 2015. You're, you're like, you know, why would you do anything different? Like, you've won. <laughs> you're at that blackjack table. You put down 100, and you, you, you made 10,000. Like and no one asked you to take any of that, and no one required you to take any of that. No policy was made to accept a give back. And not only that, in the process, you were fined hundreds of billions of dollars for all the crimes you committed along the way. You know, J.P. Morgan Chase committed felonies. I mean, they, you know, they, they actually, you know, they, they settled on them. Um, the top six banks in the United States settled for $160 billion worth of fines for stuff they did during the crisis and, and actually after the crisis because they, they made out fine with all this help from the Fed and, and the government and so forth. He doesn't have to turn around and, and say anything um, about why he's not giving that money more so uh, to, to local, to infrastructure, to even have helped those, those mortgage buyers who created ultimately his windfall. Um, that, that, that's not happening. And so, so in front of these central bankers, that was pretty much the theme. And after I spoke, a bunch of people from the Treasury Department spoke and said that everything was fine anyway. And, and, like, and again, I'm, at this point, I can't get up again. Um, but, but I'm sitting at the side of the room now, um, and they're up. And they're like, well, yeah, but we, we regulated the banks. You know, we had Dodd-Frank in 2010. We came in. We regulated them. They have more capital requirements now. The system's better. There hasn't been a bank crash since the last crash. Um, and everything's fine. And I'm like, because you just gave them a ton of money. Like, if, if again, you're at the blackjack table, you've lost, and someone's beside you saying, don't worry, I got this. Yeah, you could keep, you could keep playing for a really long time, and you look pretty good because you're not actually losing. You're, you're just you know, sort of getting an electronic allocation from somewhere else. But, but that, was, that was the feeling back then. And, and to an extent, um, that's the message right now. Right now, and I, I do spend time in Washington um, trying to talk to people on both sides of, of, of the aisle, because again, money doesn't have a, a partisan affiliation, um, and, and nor do banks. Um, in fact, Jamie Dimon um, had said when, when Trump was elected, for example, that he thought he was going to be one-term president, and then when Trump made him head of some council that he created, he was like, well, I don't know, maybe he could be around for a while. 
So it's like, you know, it, it, there's no, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter. But, but, but um, I thought um, that, that a better way um, to look at all of this, rather than having um, artificial stimulation, continued stimulation, and then worry, um, as these central banks do, who've collaboratively, collaboratively and collusively done this, that an exit strategy would be a problem. Therefore, they don't have one. They're just hoping. Um, that they can keep things up, that there won't be a big bank crash, that they were putting enough money into the system to cover up um, any problems that could be accumulating on the books of any of these same banks, um, that rather than doing that, you actually start to defer it to, um, to places that could actually do building. Um, there was a graph out today um, on Twitter that literally just showed all of this in one picture. Um, it showed um, the stock market in the last year, but it's really a ongoing trend of the last 10 years doing this, and it showed wages doing that. And it's like you don't have to know, you don't have to be an economist to, to realize that, that that's, not a, that's not really sustainable, um, you know, in terms of foundational economy, in terms of real actual growth, that, that especially when you know that it's being injected by, by artificial means, by central banks that have absolutely no responsibility to it. Um, they don't even, you know, they don't even necessarily have to have stock um, in, in in the stock market, nor do they have to worry about wages because they get paid okay. The the people in Davos right now, um, the, the heads of central banks are making between four hundred to six hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, not so much Janet Yellen and not so much Jerome Powell, who's coming in on February 4th to take your seat. Um, they're making closer to 200000 and a lot of benefits. But, you know, they get stuff like they get to fly there and they get to go places and they get to sort of spend um, the public's money to do what they do. So it, they do okay. Um, and then they go afterwards and they get these really cool sort of multi-million dollar jobs that, you know, advising private equity funds. So, I mean, ultimately their, their financial situation is secure. Um, but that money hasn't gone back into the economy that's still sitting on their books even after these particular leaders um, leave on to other posts. Um, so in terms of just ending on a sort of more positive note, um, <laughs> Because, you know, it's the beginning of the year, and there's, there, 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 there's a couple of things that, that can be done. And again, one, well, well, both of them are things that I've been trying to talk to, to our Congress people about, and um, you guys can help, just bother them. It's, it's, it's always good. Um, is that our banking system has not been reformed. It's not been restructured. We've not returned to um, a Glass-Steagall environment, which is something, um, if any of you have read any of the work I've done, I've been advocating since... Well, since before I left Wall Street, um, what, what happens now is all of that artificial money, all of that extra subsidy that's going into the banking system is doing so, and it's collateralized by our deposits. Um, so if a bank wants to buy its own stock, which Jamie Dimon denounced JP Morgan would do to the tune of $19 billion last year, and that's just one year, um, they're doing it on the back of not giving it um, as services, let's say, or additional interest payments to its own depositors, but they're doing it because like they can and, and no one's gonna say anything about it. Um, but but there, there's ways, and that's because the depositors and the checking accounts are in the same institution um, as the other side of the institution, which gets to trade and gets to reformulate new toxic assets and structured products, but now they're not made out of mortgages. They're made out of all that corporate debt and all the corporate loans that have been given out cheaply over these 10 years because rates have been so low. And so the same thing will happen again when those combust. There has been no change um, in the way in which they operate or the securities that they create, except for like the stuffing. So instead of like a cherry pie, it's a blueberry pie. It's still a pie. And, um, so that needs to happen. Those things need to be separate because then you get to a situation where when you play blackjack as a bank, you're playing with your own money. Then you're playing with your shareholders' money and not the implicit guarantee that the government will be there to back you because you are holding um, insured depositors' money of, of millions of people in your country and, and millions of people in other countries to their private banks throughout the world. Um, so, so that's something that needs to happen. Um, and also infrastructure, like things, things need to get built um, from this money. You could take four and a half trillion dollars of the, the debt that's sitting on the assets that are sitting on the Fed's book and just divert some of them into, for example, a public bank or an infrastructure bank where you can actually use that to fund real growth. And, and whether that is from an engineering perspective, whether that's from a, 
a research perspective, whether that is from, you know, rebuilding areas, you know, in terms of levees, in terms of like reducing, you know, mudslide danger, whatever it might be, um, having higher speed railways competing with the rest of the world from that, that component, um, rather than having to quibble which is what the current infrastructure conversation is in Washington, about whether or not $200 billion, Fed has four and a half trillion, whether $200 billion of federal money can go in um, into an infrastructure bill and be matched by $800 billion um, from, from states to build infrastructure. So, so what is being discussed by both parties, but sort of debated, is, is whether this trillion dollar infrastructure bill which is less than a quarter of the amount that the Fed manufactured to buy bonds, um, it can even be a trillion dollars of federal money. It's, it's not even being discussed at that level. It's 200 billion of federal money. That's what's being discussed. That, that does not grow a country. And, and that is something that's going on throughout the world. I mean, it's, it's, it's worse here um, because we were the country that sustained our banks with the most amount of liquidity from our central bank, and then we exported that. Um, that type of, uh, of a strategy. In China, for example, they also manufacture uh, money and they also create a lot of debt and they also have a top-heavy system from that perspective, but they are using it to actually build infrastructure um, in, in China, but also to create trade alliances throughout um, Southeast Asia and even with respect to Latin America and, and Mexico and, and, and countries that are sort of being excluded now from um, trade policy talks with the United States and or just having problems politically um, and, and are basically not just trying to impose politics on them, they're trying to give them um, funds with which to build infrastructure throughout the world. Uh, are there problems with, with China and how they do things? Yes. Are there problems with how we do things? Yes. But, but there is funding going on for real um, real development, and, and real development creates actual jobs, and actual jobs create um, the manifestation of actual wages, and actual wages get used to buy things in the actual economy as opposed to being done on, on just sort of borrowed money, um, which is just then part of this whole pyramid of debt that's been created since the crisis. So, so those are things that can be done, um, and those are things that they should be talking about um, tomorrow in Davos. They, they will be talking about populism and they'll be talking populism and they'll be talking about America first versus what other countries are doing. Um, and they'll be talking about trying to figure out whether or not they really have growth. But in the background, their central bankers are still going to pursue the same policies that they pursued over these last 10 years because they don't actually know what else to do without causing a massive financial crash to the entire system. Um, so if we were all to go there, <laughs> or take them camping, um, we, 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 could have, we could have those conversations, and those are the conversations that, that need to occur, and they need to occur on a regular basis. Um, so that's what I do now. Um, so so, so I've, this arc that's gotten me um, in front of you today, and, and again, I'm very honored to be here, and really thrilled you all came out, um, is, is part of really trying to dissect what's happened um, in the world, even before I was involved in the financing of it, um, but also see where we can go from here, and where, you know, sort of, real solutions can be imposed that are economically intelligent, that are not even necessarily about political opinion, but, but that make sort of economic sense. Um, and so hopefully, um, you know, every day is a sort of new day to fight for that, but, but, but that's something that can happen. Um, and I, I hope you, you know, are, are involved in terms of, you know, I'm, it sounds like you are in terms of knowing what's gone on and, 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 and learning and just, you know, being local as well. You know, one of the things that I learned in particular after the fire, and I've been writing about it anyway in my books, is that at the end of the day, after an, any kind of emergency happens, you, you know, you sort of, you know, banks close in on themselves, but they're the ones who actually also are needed to, the way our system is structured, fund things. But also, you know, people close in. You know, they care about their family. They care about their local community. Um, they care about whether, you know, the bar down the street or, or, or the restaurant that's been around for 10 or 20 years but, but exists month to month, um, and in my town in Ojai doesn't have tourists coming in because you can't breathe the air, like what's gonna happen on the next day? And so then local people have to take um, up some of that slack. Um, and, and, and that's something that you know, we can al always think of. You know, so on a community, local basis, whether it's from um, supporting local and community banks, um, and, and public banks and, and, and sort of the idea that money and, and economics is actually, a, it's a people's thing. It's not something that needs to just be dictated by the individuals that gather um, for champagne and skiing, whatever, at Davos. They're, they're, they're the things that like, we need to do, and we can do. We can do it by every decision we make every day. Um, so with that, I just want to, again, thank you for, for listening and for being here. And um, 
and, and giving this evening to each other. So, thank you.